When I was a little girl, I used to be mesmerized by the idea of life on other planets. I had a book called National Geographic's Atlas of the Universe, and I used to pore over it. And in particular, I was fascinated by a few pages that showed artists' imaginings of life on other planets. And I just show you one as an example, my favorite, which is life in the wild atmosphere of Jupiter. And you can see here, uh, a jelly blimp hanging from its giant gas bag, uh, occasionally falling prey to these uh, bird-like sword tails that would uh, pierce them from above. When I got older, I realized that my dream of becoming an extraterrestrial naturalist was probably not going to uh, be fulfilled as I had imagined it, but I also realized that there was still a way for me to travel to strange worlds populated by alien creatures. And this way actually had the added bonus of time travel. And that is by becoming a paleontologist. I love my job as a paleontologist because whereas most people just have a perspective of now, of the world as it looks today, we paleontologists get the view of more than three and a half billion years of life history, four and a half billion years of, of Earth history. So, for example, we get to travel back to the world 60 million years ago, the Paleocene, when it was much warmer, CO2 levels were much higher than they are today, there were forests in Antarctica, and there were snakes 40 feet long and literally three feet high off the ground. Makes you uh, think, ag think again about global warming. We can travel to the Middle Triassic 230 million years ago. This is before there were any mammals at all, no furry creatures on land. And the top predators were these uh, archosaurs, uh, ancestors of the dinosaurs and the crocodiles. In the oceans, there were strange reptiles, like you see here, related to plesiosaurs. We can go back even further to the late Carboniferous 300 million years ago. This was a time when there were forests, but they were unlike any forests uh, around today. There were no flowering plants at all on Earth yet. And the tallest trees you can see here in the background, more than 10 stories high, uh, belong to a group of plants known as the lycopods that today are only represented by a few tiny, scraggly, moss-like species that show no hint of their former glory. This was also an interesting world because oxygen levels were much higher at this time than they are today, one and a half times as high. And, and we think this is one of the reasons why we got insects as large as uh, this dragonfly with a two-foot wingspan. Uh, and even more impressive, millipedes eight and a half feet long. We can travel back to the Cambrian 500 million years ago. This is a time when animals first flourished on the earth. And there were uh, predators like this uh, fellow here with these grasping appendages that would use uh, these appendages to, to um, snag unsuspecting trilobites and shove, it, shove them into its camera aperture-like mouth, you see here. But today I'm going to take you back even further, 750 million years ago, to a time that uh, my research is focused on. And this was a time that until relatively recently, just the last few decades, we knew almost nothing about life. Uh, in fact, we thought that there were no fossils from this time interval. Uh, now we know that, in fact, there is a very good fossil record uh, from this time known as, known as the Precambrian. This was a very strange world, though. This was a world uh, where there were no animals at all, there were no plants on land, and with a few, very few exceptions, all life was microscopic. You can see also here that the continents were amalgamated into a supercontinent. This is not Pangaea, which you may have heard of. This is a supercontinent that existed prior to Pangaea, known as Rodinia. Oxygen levels were a lot lower than they are today, about 10%. So if we traveled back to this time, we could not have breathed. We could not have lived. Uh, in the oceans, oxygen uh, was just uh, dissolved in maybe the, the surface layers of the oceans, uh, so that was habitable. Uh, but much of the, the rest of the ocean, it was anoxic, there was no oxygen. Uh, and in fact, uh, accumulating evidence suggests that 
hydrogen sulfide, which is a poisonous gas that gives off this rotten egg smell, uh, was dissolved in much, much of the world's oceans. So, so most of the oceans were inhospitable to life. So we are going to travel right here uh, to, um, to a, a quiet seaway, a uh, shallow, warm seaway that was probably around the equator um, back then. And I forgot to mention, uh, just to sort of orient you here with the supercontinent Rodinia, this is actually North America. And you can see the Great Lakes here to orient you. Of course, they weren't around back then. Um, here is Australia, and here is Antarctica. So the, the sediments that were deposited in this quiet seaway 750 million years ago are found today in a one and a half kilometer square area uh, near the bottom of the Grand Canyon. And uh, together, uh, they compose a unit known as the Chuar Group. And you can see uh, some of these uh, beautifully colored uh, mudstones here. Now, this is what I imagine this sea looked like this time. What, what you see in the front here, what look like rocks, are actually uh, structures called stromatolites. And they're around today. I'll show you some uh, close-up examples of them here. These are limestone buildups that are formed by the action of sticky bacterial mats. So this is actually uh, one of the most obvious signs of life, macroscopic, something we can see, uh, structures built by microscopic life at this time. Uh, if we had a microscope, though, and we sampled the water around here uh, and, and looked at it, we would find that, in fact, this sea was teeming with life. And the bodies of, of these creatures are preserved today in the shales of the Chuar group. And this is just a selection of, of some of the fossils that we find in these shales. Uh, I, I must admit that may, they may not look as pretty to you as they do to me um, because, you know, they are 750 million years old, so you have to kind of cut them some slack. They've been squished, they've been cooked, um, but nonetheless, there's a lot of beautiful details that have been preserved. And I just want to uh, point out a couple of my favorites. This is one that I actually just discovered within the last two months, um, and so it doesn't have a name. I, ha I haven't given it a name yet. Uh, right now, I'm referring to it as party balloons because <laughs> I think... Uh, that it actually was, it sort of was covered in either gas or fluid-filled balloons which have been squashed here. And this is uh, one possible reconstruction of what it might have looked like in life. And I just want to note uh, here that in this slide and the next uh, couple of slides, I, I'm going to show you several reconstructions. And these are, these were produced by uh, students at Santa Ynez High School. Uh, associated with the Environmental and Spatial Technology Program. So I've been working with them to, uh, they've been helping uh, uh, sort of bring my, my organisms to life. One other thing I forgot to mention is that these are very tiny. I put up this uh, here, actual size. Actually didn't even put anything there, it's sort of a joke, because these, <laughs> they're so tiny you can't see them. Um, there are scale bars here, uh, you can see 10 micrometers. One micrometer is one one-thousandth of a millimeter. Um, so just to give you, a s give you some context, if you imagine the thickness of a single sheet of paper, these fossils are one-fourth to one-half that thick in diameter. Tiny, little grains of dust. Here's another one of my favorites. This is uh, two spheres, one inside of the other, and the inner sphere is covered by these flexible uh, spines. The outer sphere is uh, smooth. And this is uh, one uh, idea of what it might look like. Here's another one. Uh, this one uh, is kind of reminiscent of, a, of one of those giant exercise balls. I don't know if you, you know what I'm talking about. It has uh, two sort of poles, one, one at each end. You can make them out here. Uh, you may not be able to see this very well. But uh, these poles then have a series of very closely nested concentric circles that cover the entire, uh, the entire fossil, almost like lines of latitude. Here's another new species that is yet to uh, get a name. Um, I'm calling it volleyball because it has uh, sort of these um, sets of parallel ridges, uh, sort of like what uh, volleyball looks like. And then finally, this one. This one uh, I like because uh, it's, it's 
I'm pretty convinced that this is probably the resting stage or hibernating stage of one of these organisms. So we know, looking at um, modern protists, protists, for example, uh, that when times get tough, so for example, the water body that they're living in goes anoxic, they will uh, basically hunker down and, and hang out until times get better. They'll make a resistant wall that they'll hibernate in. And when times get better, uh, they will escape this resistant test, this resistant cyst, and often they will escape through pre-existing holes that, that were uh, there in, in the cyst wall. And that's what I believe is going on here, that this is this hole, and it had uh, a pretty little lid that was decorated with little balls, as you can see here, and so sort of like an escape hatch. What are these fossils? Well, actually, for most of these Precambrian fossils, we don't really know what they are. We don't have a good idea of their biological affinities. Uh, it's generally thought that they probably represent some kind of um, alga, um, and, and perhaps these, uh, for the most part, were phytoplankton floating in, in this shallow sea. I don't want to suggest, however, that this was a peaceful kingdom, because in fact we know that there were predators lurking in this ecosystem. And I have, uh, we have two lines of evidence for that. One is, if, if we look at some of these um, fossils, uh, we can see in some of them uh, very tiny, sort of irregularly distributed uh, circles. You can see some of them up there. And these look very similar to what uh, we find today, for example, you can see here in these fungal spores, uh, formed by uh, a group of amoebae known as the vampire amoebae, or the vampirellid amoebae. And you can see one of them here. It's sticking out its finger-like extensions of the cell. These are called pseudopods, uh, sneaking up on this poor unsuspecting um, alga. Here it is, uh, it has punctured the algal cell wall with its pseudopod, and it's, it's sucking out the contents the way a vampire sucks out uh, blood. That's how they got their name. Uh, and then here it is happily digesting the contents. The other line of evidence uh, for predators at this time, and I should say microscopic predators, right, uh, is the f uh, another group of fossils that um, we, s we find in the Chuar group. These are known collectively as vase-shaped microfossils. You can see here it's sort of vase-like in shape with an opening at one end. Uh, and these are preserved literally by the trillions in the Chuar group. Um, that's one of the great things about studying microfossils. You almost never run out of samples. Um, here is just a selection of some of the different forms that, that we see. You can see some of them uh, have these beautiful little triangular openings, for example. Some of them have uh, curved tests. Uh, and I won't go into the details, but uh, suffice it to say that uh, for all of these species, uh, or most of these species, there's almost a one-to-one -one correspondence with, uh, with um, a group, wi with structures made by a modern group of protists. You can see here's the fossil, here's the modern. A modern group of protists known as testate amoebae. Now, you've probably heard of amoebae, uh, and what comes to mind are the naked type of amoebae you can see up on that screen. But uh, there are some amoebae that can also produce tests in the same, uh, or shells in the same way that a snail produces a shell. And here are some of the uh, pseudopods here of this, amoeba, of this amoeba. Now, uh, testate amoebae we know today are predators. They dine on bacteria, protists. They even um, dine on uh, small animals. Um, and in fact, we have evidence uh, from the Chuar group fossils that perhaps something was dining on these testate amoebae uh, as well. These are not those, those openings uh, that I showed you in the tes test, but actually these unusual semicircular holes uh, that um, we find in some of the tests. And uh, to be honest, I don't know how these were made, but my best guess is that they were made by some other predator. So here we are, 750 million years ago, three billion years after life first appeared on the planet, and we see that the, the, the biosphere was actually quite diverse. In this sea alone, we have bacterial mats forming limestone buildups. We have probably phytoplankton, a diversity of phytoplankton floating in the surface waters. We have amoebae dining on probably the bacteria and 
the phytoplankton and perhaps on each other as well. In a few million years, uh, glaciers would grow, begin growing uh, from the poles, sea level would fall, and this sea would dry up. And in fact, rivers would carve deep valleys into some of the sediments that were deposited here. Glaciers would continue to grow, and in fact, uh, would get to the point where ice almost entirely entombed the planet for millions of years, such that it looked very much like a snowball from outer space. We refer to these as snowball earth glaciations. And almost all of the fossils that I have shown you, uh, the creatures that, that were left, uh, will have d disappeared from the planet uh, forever. You know, when I'm in the middle of, of doing this work, sometimes I take a step back and I, I sort of almost pinch myself. And I think, this is not make-believe. These worlds that I'm talking about were real. These worlds once existed and these creatures once existed. And I think it's amazing and it's beautiful and it's humbling. And I think what a privilege it is to have lived, even for such an incredibly short period of time, you know, when you think of the, the grand scheme of life on this planet, three and a half billion years and counting. What a privilege it is to have lived and to have been a part of all of this. Thank you.